we need to take a more proactive role and a broader view of our responsibility. It's not enough to just build tools. We need to make sure that they're used for good. Millions of Facebook users have had their data shared where they didn't expect it. Is it the wake-up call we need? Today, we look at how social media has changed the world and our lives. We explore the good, bad, and ugly sides of social media. I'm Lorna Duick. I'm Sheldon Neal. And this is Context. Psychologist Dr. Daniel Amen is here to tell us about how our brains are operating on social media. Does God have a social media preference? We speak to Joanna LaFleur about social media and our creator. And although there's so much utility to the internet, Dr. Ashesh Mukherjee tells us about the internet trap and the costs of living online. The news has portrayed social media as our enemy, yet are there some good stories about what social media has done for us? Sheldon will find that a little later. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. Our responsibility now is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. That was Mark Zuckerberg apologizing to Facebook users for its data breach that affected over 50 million users. Facebook is also accused of harming democracy for selling user insights to data manipulators who allegedly tricked the political opinions of some Facebook users that may have resulted in public opinion being shaped by Russian hackers. All of this put Mr. Zuckerberg to account. Listen in as he speaks to a Senate committee before Congress. Will you make the commitment to changing all the user default settings to minimize to the greatest extent possible the collection and use of users' data? That's, I don't think that's hard for you to say yes to unless I'm missing something. Congressman, this is a complex issue that I think is, deserves more than a one-word answer. Well, again, that's disappointing to me. Yes or no, is Facebook limiting the amount or type of data Facebook itself collects or uses? Congressman, yes, we limit a lot of the data that we collect and use. Here's what everybody's been trying to tell you today, and I, I, I say this gently. Your user agreement sucks. <laughs> Facebook has detailed profiles on people who have never signed up for Facebook, yes or no? Uh, Congressman, in, in general, we collect data of people who have not signed up for Facebook for security purposes. It's been admitted by Facebook that you do collect data points on non-average users. So my question is, can someone who does not have a Facebook account opt out of Facebook's involuntary data collection? Congressman, anyone can turn off and, and opt out of any data collection for ads, whether they use our services or not. Um, you've said everyone controls their data, but you're collecting data on people that are not even Facebook users that have never signed a consent, a privacy agreement, and you're collecting their data. In 2010, Steve Jobs, when he was releasing the iPad, described the iPad as a device that was extraordinary. The best browsing experience you ever had, way better than a laptop, way better than a smartphone. It's an incredible experience. Now, a couple of months later, he was approached by a journalist from the New York Times, and they had a long phone call. And at the end of the call, the journalist threw in a question that seemed like a, a sort of softball. He said to him, your kids must love the iPad. And there's an obvious answer to this, but what Jobs said really staggered the journalist. He was very surprised because he said, they haven't used it. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. Brain health expert Dr. Daniel Amen is not keen on social media. He's dubbed America's most popular psychiatrist. Dr. Amen specializes in neurology and psychiatry, and he joins us now from California. Dr. Amen, when it comes to social media addiction, what is underway with young people and social media? Well, it's terrible, and it's just seemingly to get worse and worse that the, the more a uh, child or teenager spends time on social media, the more depressed they are, the more overweight they are, the more socially isolated they are. This has not been a good trend for the mental health of our youth. Now with 
20 percent of girls. I mean, it's really crazy when you think about it. 20 percent of girls meet the criteria for major depression. So that is really a very serious issue. But what is in the social media dynamics with all the different kinds, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat? What's in these dynamics that is harming youth? Well, it's, it's a number of factors. One, they're not outside, so they have lower levels of vitamin D. They have lower exercise. They also have lower face-to-face -face human interaction, uh, which is negative. But I think the big thing that's hurting children is they begin to compare their lives with people who have fake lives. So people who tell everybody the world is really rosy and awesome all the time, and when their life doesn't live up, uh, they get sad. Uh, they are constantly comparing themselves in a negative way to sort of the f people who are on uh, Facebook. You know, if you think of Kim Kardashian, it's like, here's my life. It's so awesome. When, when you really know about her from a lot of news stories, not awesome. Uh, but people think it is, and they think they are less than other people. Is there more to this? Is there brain activity that we should be concerned about? Your clinics have done nearly 140,000 brain scans. What can you tell us about the effect social media has on our brains? We know, for example, the more a person looks at things like pornography, and this is happening more and more in young teenage boys uh, because it's just so widely available. It actually is associated with lower function uh, in their prefrontal cortex. So that most human thoughtful part of their brain seems to be shrinking. Also, there was a fascinating study by Microsoft in 2015 that said the human attention span is now eight seconds. A goldfish is nine seconds. So I'd say this is evolution going the wrong way. When you're constantly waited, waiting for that next email, that next text, that next social media post, um, it begins to wear out the pleasure centers in your brain and leaves a lot of people what we call thrilled to death, uh, where it's just like cocaine in that it makes you feel really good in the short run, but can devastate your life in the long run. There has been some talk of tech companies coming to terms that they hire neuroscientists to make the programming addictive. Is there validity to that, that coming to terms with that? No question. There's actually a book written about it called Hooked, you know, how you create addictive programs. And so this absolutely is happening. Just like the food companies hire neuroscientists to produce food with the perfect meltiness, crunchiness, aroma, and so on. I mean, you know the food companies are going after your children. It's so clear. Uh, Facebook was just launched a child's app. Uh, they're going after your children, and we have to protect them from uh, what's happening in society at large. Okay, these are important issues to be aware of for our children. We're going to have more with you, Dr. Daniel Amen, just a little later in the show. Stay tuned. I get a call late one night in April 1995 that my nine-year-old godson, Andrew, who's also my nephew, attacks a little girl on the baseball field for no particular reason. And I'm on the phone with Sherry, my sister-in-law, going, excuse me? She said, Danny... He's different. He's mean. He never smiles anymore. I went into his room today and I found two pictures that he had drawn. One of them, he's hanging from a tree. The other picture, he's shooting other children. Andrew is Columbine, Sandy Hook, Aurora waiting to happen. And I'm like, I want to see him the next day. And they drove from Southern California to Northern California. That's where we had our first clinic. And I'm like, Andy, he's sitting on the couch in my office, and I love this child. I'm like, honey, what's going on? And he said, Uncle Danny, I'm mad all the time, and I don't know why. And I'm like, is anybody hurting you? 
He said, no. I said, is anybody teasing you? And he said, no. I said, is anybody touching you in places they shouldn't touch you? And he said, no. And my first thought is you have to scan him. Joanna Leffler is the communications director for C4 Church. She joins me now. Uh, Joanna, what does an online social media conscious church look like? Well, I love that you use the word conscious because uh, the church has the most important message in the world. And so we should be the best communicators in the world. And that means we need to be conscious about how are people in our culture communicating today? I mean, that's been, been from the Roman road systems to the printing press, television, radio, and now on social media. And so we need to be aware of where and how people are communicating and reach them right in those places. And what does healthy digital balance look like for the church now and especially going forward as technologies and algorithms evolve? What does that kind of balance look like for the church? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, of course, we need to be conscious as as churches, as Christians, as thinkers of faith and theology about what it looks like to be online and what we're reading and, and what is true and what is fake news and how to navigate that. I mean, I would recommend to anyone that don't get all your news just from one source, right? We should be looking and reading uh, thinkers. We should be looking and reading from people from a cross-section of um, political thought or not just on social media, but also in, in books and in our churches and in, um, in other places that we get our news and our conversations. We want to get as wide of a perspective as we can uh, so that whatever we get on social media, if that is being controlled by algorithms and technology, uh, that we have something larger to draw from as we're considering how to respond to the world. And how is the Christian faith being impacted when it comes to sharing the gospel specifically and having yeah. the message of Christ remaining attractive and not just something users, you know, scroll through on their online feed next to, you know, the next picture of a cat? There's so much opportunity to be creative, to call people's attention to things that are hopeful. We know that that a lot of people are using social media report that they're lonely and they're depressed after using social media. So what does it look like for churches to engage with positive messages and to invite people into a meaningful conversation that's hopeful and also bringing them into a community of real people who really care for them rather than just um, sticking to our enclaves online. I mean, there's, there's this uh, writer named Vincent Donovan. He was a missionary in the 60s and 70s to the Maasai people in Africa. And one of the things that he said in his book, Christian, they rediscovered. I love this. I'm going to read this. It says, evangelization is a process of bringing the gospel to people where they are, mm. not where you want them to be. And so where are people? We know that there's billions of people now who are spending their lives on social media hours and hours a day, more hours a day than anyone is ever spending in their week in the church. And so we need to go and reach out to people right where they are, bringing church, the good news of Jesus, the hope of the gospel to people on the internet. Joanna Leffler, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, no problem. That was Joanna Leffler, Communications Director of C4 Church. She joined me from Toronto, Canada. I want you to imagine walking into a room, a control room with a bunch of people, a hundred people hunched over at desks with little dials, and that that control room will shape the thoughts and feelings of a billion people. This might sound like science fiction, but this actually exists right now, today. We live a lot of our lives online. The internet provides us with information on almost everything. We even build and enhance human relationships through social media. But our next guest, Dr. Ashish Mukherjee, says there are five costs to living online. He joins us from McGill University. Uh, what can you tell us about social media and social comparisons of our virtual selves? It's a blessing in the sense you can keep in touch with friends and family around the world, but it's also a den of comparison because uh, it's like a giant fishbowl. And uh, I've done a couple of studies where we looked at how people use Facebook and what are the effects of Facebook use. Uh, um, and what we found was quite interesting. Um, uh, and so in one of the studies, we asked people to browse Facebook uh, and uh, we asked people to report what emotions they experienced. And we found that a lot of people reported feeling envious of others. And uh, we also tracked what they did online afterwards. And we found that people were more likely to browse products on Amazon, more likely to buy products. 
So if you heard about shopping therapy, and so in a sense, what I find is that uh, social media uh, has a negative effect. In other words, it makes us envious and more likely to shop. What does your book have to say about the recent Facebook scandal and living our lives online? There are, there are two aspects to it. Uh, one is the privacy aspect, and the other is the fake news aspect. Now, you know, one question you could ask is that why are people so careless when they go online with their, with their personal data? Privacy is, is an abstract concept in people's minds. And so when we go online, we are focusing on more concrete things like browsing pictures, posting, watching videos. And it turns out our mind uh, is much more receptive to concrete information than abstract information. Uh, the other aspect of the whole Facebook story is that once Cambridge got this information about, uh, about 25, 30% of uh, US voters, they were able to segment these uh, Facebook users into different groups, uh, likely Republicans, likely Democrats, and un undecideds. And so they're able to segment. And that's actually the, the secret behind Facebook's profits and Google's profits. So Google knows what we search, and Facebook knows who we are. Uh, then uh, Cambridge then sent out fake news. So fake news works because it works through this so-called confirmation bias, that if you get fake news, which confirms your existing opinions, then that fake news is going to have a big effect on your likelihood of voting. Um, uh, doctor, if I could just quickly jump in, and I, I just want to, I really want to ask this quick question to you, just briefly, you can hit it. Uh, but don't we know uh, what we're getting ourselves into? I, I heavily engage on Instagram, that's that's my social platform. We know when you open up an account that you're, you're at risk of people hacking. Like, we know what we're getting ourselves into. And when I look at the five critical mistakes we make and how sometimes it's like the user is the victim, I'm just wondering, is there a healthy balance with that? I, I guess I'll, I'll just say two things. One is that uh, you know when when you started using Instagram or when people start using Facebook, they do in fact read a privacy disclaimer, which is you know three or four pages long. Mm -hmm. But in my research, I found that uh, people generally don't read that disclosure because it was too much information, and they just blindly click OK to that. And so that tells us something about the way people think and act. Uh, too much information uh, leads people to use shortcuts. You know, is it a trusted brand? Is it a brand that everyone is using? So they don't really think in depth. So that's one side to it. And the other side to it is that, um, you know, we have a need to look good in other, other people's eyes. And that is much stronger than any concern that we have for privacy. Privacy is an abstract thing, as I said. Very powerful point, the need to look good over privacy. Very interesting stuff in your new book, The Internet Trap. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Ashish Mukherjee. He joined me from Montreal. Still to come, more with Dr. Daniel Amen. How limiting your social media intake improves your brain health. Millions displaced by war. Thousands of others want to leave their home countries in search of a new life. We look at stories of people in the throes of immigration. That's coming soon to Context. We're all familiar with the brutal nature of social media, from harassment to bullying to even worse, on a new frontier known as the dark web. But there is good on social media. Take a look. The bright side of social media is evident everywhere. People banding together to help others or to give rise to life-changing issues all in the hopes of spurring positive change. The Me Too movement. It echoed across all spheres of cultural influence. A new day is on the horizon. Women and even some men of all ages that claimed sexual abuse at the hands of men in power took to social media with the hashtag Me Too. That sparked a global movement and changed the public discourse on women's rights and the right to be free from harassment of any kind in the workplace. Pray for Humboldt. Here in Canada, the Humboldt Broncos GoFundMe page has reached over $10 million. It is now the largest number of contributions to a GoFundMe campaign in history, started by two hockey moms, Sylvie Kellington and Kaylin Hergott, who never dreamt it would grow to what it has. 
Another new frontier for you all, of course, is the GoFundMe page for the Humboldt Broncos. It's over $7 million. Help us understand where the money will go. That's something that uh, will go towards the, the Broncos, uh, the, the players and their families um, uh, that were in this horrific accident. And, and the Broncos have indicated, I believe, that they're just going to they're going to hire a third party to try to sort that out for them as well. Um, a little bit of arm's length because, you know, it's it's being involved with the families personally and that type of thing. I think it's just all overwhelming uh, to everybody. Becca told me to. A brave young girl's story in New Brunswick. After learning her diagnosis of brain cancer was terminal in 2016, Becca Schofield sparked a global movement marked by kindness to others. Taking to social media, she asked people to do something kind for someone else, sparking the hashtag Becca told me to campaign. The movement brought international attention, even from the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who took to Twitter to recognize Becca on her inspiring life. Living in our constant 24-7 digital universe, it's difficult to get away from our smartphones, tablets, and laptops. And now that we've found out all of our data is, well, pretty well being shared around the world, it raises an important question. Can social media be trusted? This is publicity and brand strategist Jamila Ramad. With over 13 years of experience in the biz, she connects clients and users through the power of social media platforms. I asked her if online platforms are still a safe and trusted way to engage with people, and if given recent news surrounding online user privacy and trust, if that has led her to change the way she manages her own online presence. With technology and with social media, even though everything seems a bit weird, a bit uncomfortable right now, um, nothing's going to change. Technology is always going to be innovative. It's always going to be moving forward. So one of the best places that I would say to build your platform on, especially if you're trying to reach national levels or global levels, is going to be through social media because it's at the ease of your fingertips. Every day we're on our cell phones. Every day, um, you know, we're checking our Facebook accounts and so is everyone else. So if you want to promote yourself, if you want to build community, you want to build your tribe, social media is still going to be the best place. And as far as safety, um, that's all determined, I think, by the user. Um, while we are at the will of the platform, you know, Facebook controls a lot of things. We also have the opportunity to watch out for ourselves. And I think we have to be um, our best security system. You say, can you trust social media? But at the same time, we have willingly given our information away to these platforms. And now we want to talk about trust. So I think that one of the, the foundations of everything that you're going to have to do when it comes to engaging on social media and constantly being active is remembering, you know, what you want to share and what you don't want to share and the things that you would hold private to yourself. Um, you know, whatever's going on in the background, maybe, maybe you don't want to share that. Maybe you don't want to geotag everything that you're doing for safety reasons. So when it says trust a platform, um, I think that you have to be more willing to trust yourself and know what it is that you're engaging in. One thing that is clear is the world of social media is here to stay. And as more and more people continue to engage with life online, we hope it will continue to spur stories of the good. For Context TV, I'm Sheldon Neal. I quit social media for a month, so I quit Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Just needed a break. It was time to cut myself off. I stopped using social media this morning, and my brain is going crazy. I wake up feeling way more rested. I spend nine hours a day staring at a screen at my job and cutting down on screen time outside of the office has changed my world. I don't have as many headaches. I don't feel tired all the time. It just like makes so much sense. We're back with Dr. Daniel Amen, a brain specialist on the health of our brains when it's engaged with social media. Uh, Dr. Amen, we just did children. Your views on that were pretty, uh, pretty clear. But now let's talk about adults. How does social media affect our interpersonal skills? <laughs> I hear this all the time in my office, that the other woman is not, in fact, the other woman. It's someone's cell phone or it's someone's social media profile. 
it is distracting our attention from the real people in our lives. And therefore, you know, it's not uncommon to go out to dinner and watch a whole family, not in fact talking to each other, they are um, interacting with their gadgets. And that's not a good thing for our families. You've also stated that an adult's faith in God is challenged by social media. How is that so? You know, your faith in God really does have to do with the health of your brain. And as our brains become less healthy, we become more impulsive, we become more cynical, and uh, it can really challenge uh, the spiritual life for people. You, you know, I've been a psychiatrist nearly 40 years, and it, it seems like things have really changed where people had a deeper sense of meaning and purpose. They believed they were on the planet for a reason. And that has been eroded in my experience working with patients, where when I ask them why they're on the planet, they often say they don't know, or it's just by random chance. And if you're constantly comparing yourselves to others and really not being reflective on the inside, uh, it can hurt how you feel. Purposeful people live longer, they're happier, they heal from Ill illnesses faster. And I think we're having sort of less purpose-driven lives. You've got this wonderful fact in your work that there are more connections in our brain than there are stars in the universe. Are we sure about that? It is. In fact, your brain has the storage capacity of six million years of the Wall Street Journal. Um, your brain is the most special organ in the universe. So if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, your brain is the inner sanctum. It is just so amazing. So then the scriptural challenge that we renew our mind by thinking about Jesus, does that make a difference in the healing of people's minds? That would be reading scripture, that would be praying. Does it actually work to heal your mind? There's no question. Uh, we've actually studied people who focus on what they love ab about their lives versus what they hate about their lives. And I was just working with, I work with a professional golfer and uh, after she hits certain shots, she'll just say the worst things about herself to herself. And I'm like, that's gonna make it more likely you're gonna hit the next shot badly because uh, your thoughts moment by moment have a physical impact on the functioning of your brain. Okay, once again, closing thoughts on what parents should do with the Facebook Messenger app that's focused on children. Delete it. Um, the less time they spend on social media, the happier, the more engaged, the better they will do in school. And God gave children, parents, to be their frontal lobes until their kids' frontal lobes develop, which is really not until their mid-20s. So be a good supervisor. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Amen. Thanks so much. That was Dr. Daniel Amen, who joined us from one of his clinics in California. Millions displaced by war, Thousands of others want to leave their home countries in search of a new life. We look at stories of people in the throes of immigration. That's coming soon to Context. A new concept we learned today is digital sin. Addictive qualities have been deliberately woven into our devices, and sometimes we cannot resist the forbidden fruit, even when it takes us into depression and envy. So let's fight for an alternative and remember just how much we all need affirmation, encouragement, and friendship. That's what's driving social media, but we need it in FaceTime, like real face to real face. So let's keep an eye out for each other. From all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching.